you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, Jesus came to Jericho and intended to pass through the town. Now a man there named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector and also a wealthy man, was seeking to see who Jesus was. But he could not see him because of the crowd, for he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree in order to see Jesus, who was about to pass that way. When he reached the place, Jesus looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down quickly, for today I must stay at your house. And he came down quickly and received him with joy. When they all saw this, they began to grumble, saying, He has gone to stay at the house of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Behold, half of my possessions, Lord, I shall give to the poor. And if I have extorted anyone, anything from anyone, I shall repay it four times over. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a descendant of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save what was lost. The Gospel of the Lord. Election time. There can be a, a lot of different things going on as the election approaches. We, have, we may have gotten into some arguments with people, or maybe there's some confusion, doubt. But I think my favorite thing about election time are the bumper stickers. There are some real winners out there this year. Some of them I can't repeat in here because they're, they're uh, a little too inappropriate. But there's one that I saw that I think is hilarious, and it says... Giant Meteor 2016 just ended already. Maybe some of you have seen this. Maybe some of you have it on your car. I'll have to go out and check later. But this is kind of the sentiment we have. And to be, to be serious, it's obvious that many people today are anxious, worried, maybe even fearful about where we're heading. There's a lot of questions that we ask ourselves. Where are we heading? Is, there a meteor, is the meteor inevitable? What will happen on November 8th? And most importantly, I think the question, where is God in all of this? How does a faithful Catholic respond to our current situation? And even more broadly than the election, our American culture. One man who found himself in another dire situation in history was Sir Winston Churchill. And I'm reminded of a speech that he made in 1941 at Harrow School. And some of you, I'm sure many of you have heard this before. His words are very meaningful. He said this, Not less we praise in sterner days. Do not let us speak of darker days. Let us speak rather of sterner days. These are not dark days. These are great days. The greatest days our country has ever lived. And we must all thank God that we have been allowed, each of us, according to our stations, to play a part in making these days memorable in the history of our race. Powerful words from Sir Winston Churchill. And my friends, these words are no less applicable or meaningful for us. These could be some of the greatest days of our church, days where we may be called to give more fully of ourselves each of us according to our stations, to play a part in making these days holy for the Lord. That's the truth. It's akin to the time of the apostles when they went into the pagan Roman Empire, all odds against them, and they toppled it and conquered it for Christ. Christianity spread throughout the whole world. Our gospel today gives us the answer to our question, to all of these questions. The answer is Jesus Christ. The task before us is conversion, greater conversion. We all know the story of Zacchaeus and the sycamore tree, but as we know from experience, the gospel is always fresh, always new. There's always something that God is educating in us, forming in us in a new way. 
So let's dive in and see what there is. We find Jesus in Jericho, having just healed a blind man, even though the crowd tried to stop him. Keep that in mind, this crowd. They tried to prevent him from healing the blind man. And now we have Zacchaeus, a despised tax collector. Remember that tax collectors at this time would scoop off the top of, the, of what was brought in from taxes in order to line their pockets. So these, these were very despised men. They were powerful. They, were, they, kind of had, they had sold themselves out to the Romans in order to become rich. In the culture of that time, for a powerful man like Zacchaeus to run and then climb a sycamore tree, this would have been shameful. It would have brought shame upon him and his whole family. But he does it. He's looking for something. And though the text does not explicitly say that Zacchaeus was mocked by the crowd, we can safely assume that he was. That he would, as soon as the people would have seen him in this tree, they would have started laughing, jeering. This was their chance to get back at him. This man who had taken so much of their, of their livelihood. But Jesus does not respond this way. He said that St. Luke tells us, Jesus looked up and said, Zacchaeus calling him by name. What was it about Jesus' gaze, his look, that captured this man's heart? How can we explain this sudden change in Zacchaeus, this man completely bent on himself, all of a sudden becoming docile to the gift of Christ? It's as if he knew for the first time not only how small he really was, but how much he was loved by God. And all of this because Jesus looked at him with the love of God burning in his eyes, piercing through bone and marrow to find the target in Zacchaeus' heart. One theologian describes this powerful gaze in this way. He said, The ability to take hold of the heart of a man is the greatest, most persuasive miracle of all. The best miracle of all. The eyes reveal the depth of a person, the mystery of their inmost being. When we look into someone's eyes, we see something that is divine in them, something that is the image of God. So Zacchaeus took a risk. He climbed this tree, following a foolish instinct to see Jesus. And what he saw was the eternal mercy of the Father. There was no other choice for him but to go all in to have a full conversion of heart. This event recalls the love and mercy of God to a hardened sinner and his subsequent conversion, but we cannot forget that there's another character in this story. The crowd's reaction is very different. He has gone to stay at the house of a sinner, they say. Just as he tried to silence, just as the crowd tried to silence the blind man, they would have kept Jesus from speaking to Zacchaeus from going to his home. Because you see, the crowd's interest in Jesus is entirely superficial. It's surface level. They want Jesus, but only on their terms, so long as he measured up to their expectations. It was another such crowd that later on would hail Jesus as the Messiah King and then crucify him a few days later. The crowd. My friends, this crowd still abounds today. In these sterner days, as Sir Winston Churchill put it, the crowd of our modern culture has at best a superficial interest in Jesus Christ, so long as he fits whatever agenda is at hand and being promoted. Anyone who is wishing to catch a glimpse of him is roundly mocked, humiliated, brushed aside, even persecuted. Those who follow him totally will likely be subject to the same mistreatment and persecution that he suffered. This is our culture. And so we find ourselves in this contemporary American society, a land that's supposed to promote religion, Christianity, that's supposed to give us the freedom to religion, freedom of worship. And we find ourselves in these seemingly dark days. But they are not dark days. 
They're sterner days, they're difficult days, but not dark days. I said before that Jesus himself, with his look of love, is the answer to our situation. And I stand by that. We have hope in this difficult time because Jesus Christ has already won. He's already conquered death. And he will see us through. Those who believe in his word and who follow him. Yet there is still a task at hand. It's not enough just to believe, but to act on that belief. To live a converted life. And that is all of us. There is an ancient letter in the history of the church that describes the role of Christians in the pagan world of ancient Rome. I'd like to share a few words of this letter with you. The author is unknown, but this teaches us what it means to be a Christian in a difficult situation. The author says, What the soul is in the body, Christians are in the world. This is the analogy, the soul and the body. The soul is dispersed through all the members of the body, and Christians are scattered through all the cities of the world. The soul dwells in the body, yet is not of the body. And Christians dwell in the world, yet are not of the world. God has assigned them this illustrious position, which it were unlawful for them to forsake. This is our mission, brothers and sisters. This is our mission, to live with converted hearts in the midst of a broken world, to be the soul in this body that is suffering. These are not darker days, but the greatest days, the time when saints are called for and when saints are made. For this reason, we cannot compromise with the culture. We cannot compromise with the culture. Yes, we must participate. We must use our gifts and our skills to help bring about what is good, true, and beautiful through voting, voting according to the mind of the church, voting, working towards the common good of all, participating in the public square. But it may be that certain things in our life have to go. Maybe certain TV shows, movies, time spent on the internet or the phone, excessive sports or clubs that draw our children away from the family, practices at work that keep us away from our family or lead us into difficult situations. Whatever keeps us from living with fully converted hearts, these things are not worth it. It's not enough just to vote on November 8th according to the mind of the church and according to our conscience. It's about living this life fully. When we turn to the eyes of Jesus Christ in prayer, we will know what it means to love, what it means to give ourselves for what is good. We have an opportunity now in a real way to take hold of this, to live with converted hearts. Father Saunders is asking our parish to spend the next 10 days in prayer and fasting. Really, real prayer, real fasting. There's a novena in the bulletin, I believe, that is a chance for us to pray together as a parish for the next 10 days. And also fasting, to, take, to really make some, some sacrifice, great or small, to pray for our country. This is the path of the converted heart. We pray and ask God to come in and dwell with us. We welcome him into our home. Prayer from a converted heart is the first step in bringing about the greater conversion of our society. And so, to go back to the meteor, it's not the meteor, the giant meteor 2016. It's not that that's the answer. Yes, we long for the coming of Christ, his second coming, the last day. But for now, our focus should not be on the darker days, but upon the task at hand. These are not dark days. They're sterner days, difficult days, but not dark. This is the greatest time to be a Christian when all the world seems against us. But we have climbed the tree like Zacchaeus. We have seen the eyes of Christ. And now we can welcome him into this world even if no one else will.